often talk about history being made in this street, but the last 24 hours have been unique. In the last century, no, forget that, the last three centuries, it's hard to recall any departure quite as catastrophic and, frankly, humiliating. As dawn broke over number 10 today, the Prime Minister was still holed up, dreaming of survival. And you could pick your statistic. Almost 50 ministers or members of the government gone. Three education secretaries in three days. Ministers saying he should resign even as they refuse to do so themselves. But finally, at lunchtime, the definitive admission, it was over. I know that there will be many people who are relieved and uh, perhaps quite a few who will also be disappointed. And I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. As his wife and a small band of supporters watched, there was little sense of humility. The decision to remove him was, he said, eccentric. And the herd instinct is powerful. When the herd moves, it moves. And my friends, in politics, no one is remotely indispensable. It was a brutal end to a remarkable political career, his children waiting inside a reminder of the human emotions amidst the tumult. But even his statement this lunchtime did not end the fierce debate about his future. Should he be allowed to stay on until a new leader is chosen? Many Tory MPs were clear, absolutely not. He should leave office at the earliest possible opportunity, and preferably today. It will not be tenable for him to continue as a caretaker if he cannot fill the ministerial appointments he needs to. Who are the runners and riders for the succession? Rishi Sunak tops polls with the public, but it is the party that will choose. If the Prime Minister is to be changed, what about Tory party policy? Will we see tax cuts? The government's financial watchdog has a catastrophic warning on the public finances. And his was a rise and fall like no other. How did a man who won his party such a huge majority only a short time ago end up leaving office like this? From Downing Street, this is ITV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Good evening. His enemies said nothing characterised the man like the manner of his parting. And if his supporters would take bitter issue with that, there can be no argument about what we've witnessed these past 24 hours. A man who just could not seem to accept defeat. Boris Johnson has always defied convention and today was no exception. He is going, but not gone. He wants a soft exit to stay on here in Downing Street as Prime Minister until the autumn and a successor has been chosen. He's even begun a reshuffle of ministers to take him through to October or November, which is making many of his MPs more than a touch jittery. In the end, Mr Johnson had no choice but to step down. A morning rush hour of further ministerial resignations forced his hand. His government was simply imploding. So, this lunchtime, standing here in Downing Street, the Prime Minister described his sadness at giving up what he called the best job in the world. There was no apology, but there was some recrimination. He blamed what he called the herd instinct of Westminster for being forced into this change of mind. But again, as he put it, them's the breaks. When the famous lectern came out at 12.15, it meant, as usual, the worst news for the occupant of 10 Downing Street, the Prime Minister. And when those who work there gathered to give him moral support, including today Boris Johnson's wife Carrie and baby Romy, there was no room for doubt. Boris Johnson would be resigning three years after he got the job he always wanted. It is clearly now the will of the Parliamentary Conservative Party that there should be a new leader of that party and therefore a new Prime Minister. And I've agreed with Sir Graham Brady, the chairman of our backbench MPs, that the process of choosing that new leader should begin now. And the timetable will be announced next week. And I've today appointed a cabinet to serve, as I will, until a new leader is in place. 
So we don't yet know how long he'll remain as caretaker Prime Minister, and he didn't hide that he has no desire to go. And the reason I have fought so hard in the last few days to continue to deliver that mandate in person was not just because I wanted to do so, but because I felt it was my job, my duty, my obligation to you to continue to do what we promised in 2019. The Prime Minister then listed what he sees as his achievements, taking the UK out of the EU, the Covid vaccination programme, with no mention of what's gone wrong, the law-breaking parties, the predatory behaviour of his last Deputy Chief Whip, the questions over who paid for gold wallpaper. He even accused Tory MPs who wanted to get rid of him as a herd. In the last few days I've tried to persuade my colleagues that it would be eccentric to change governments when we're delivering so much and when we have such a vast mandate and when we're actually only a handful of points behind in the polls, even in mid-term after quite a few months of pretty relentless sledging and when the economic scene is so difficult domestically and internationally. And I regret uh, not to have been successful in those arguments. And of course, it's painful not to be able to see through so many ideas and, and projects myself. But as we've seen uh, at Westminster, uh, the herd instinct is powerful and when the herd moves, it moves. And my friends, in politics, no one is remotely indispensable. I know that there will be many people who are relieved and uh, perhaps quite a few who will also be disappointed. And I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. A moment then to be with family and friends and for a hug from someone he married while here, and another who was born here. Drama doesn't quite describe how Boris Johnson's term of office has come to an end. Just last night he was arguing he was indispensable and he vowed he wouldn't be pushed out by the stampede of ministers resigning from his government and the sheer number of his MPs saying they'd lost confidence in him. But he could cling on no longer after a Chancellor of the Exchequer he'd appointed just on Tuesday said, this is not sustainable and it will only get worse for you, Prime Minister, for the Conservative Party and most importantly, for the country. You must do the right thing and go now. And an Education Secretary, also in post for less than two days, said she would resign. But even though Johnson's critics seem to have got their way, they're anxious about how long it'll be till he's actually out the door. Labour will step up in the national interest and bring a vote of no confidence because we can't go on with this Prime Minister clinging on for months and months to come. I do think it is quite incredible though to suggest that he will remain as Prime Minister for another three to four months. I think the sooner he is out of number 10 and preferably that is today, uh, the better. A former Tory Prime Minister, John Major, is also uneasy about Boris Johnson staying in Downing Street even for a few more weeks. He wrote, For the overall well-being of the country, Mr Johnson shouldn't remain in Downing Street for any longer than necessary to affect the smooth transition of government. As for Boris Johnson's immediate predecessor, she made clear that whoever succeeds Boris Johnson must learn at least one important lesson. Playing by the rules means following them not because you have to, but because you do so willingly, recognising that the damage from breaking them may not be direct or immediate, but it can be severe and lasting. And, emerging from Wimbledon, another ex-Tory leader was relieved Johnson is leaving the game. It was overdue. Very good. Things are improving. So who next? ITV News asked a new member of the caretaker cabinet if he'd be a candidate. <laughs> I've been in politics a long time. I got up this morning not imagining for a minute that I'd be back in Cabinet, so I've learned to expect the unexpected. What I do want is somebody who embodies One Nation values. One Nation is what he said he'd build. Thank you all very much. But a series of scandals which some say stem from his character have split his party, split the nation and caused his term in office to end in failure. Well, as you would know, on a massive light like this, Robert is here to talk about all this with me. There's lots of things to talk about tonight, and we will talk about them. But can we just talk about the next 24 hours? I don't think either of us have ever last seen... 24 hours, last 24 hours. Sorry, I don't think any of us could have even imagined a 24 hours like this in which you'd see a prime minister hold up, defying everything, defying everyone. What do you think that was about? Was that about thinking he really had a chance of surviving? Was it just not being able to accept defeat? 
So you're right, it was completely remarkable. I mean, as I saw the number of ministers and aides resigning from the government and, you know, saw that, frankly, he was going to really struggle to govern because he just mm. couldn't get people from the backbenches to replace them. And secondly, when I saw, saw the number of his backbench MPs who were very publicly calling him to, for, to, to resign, it was clear to me the game was up. Well over half the parliamentary party were against him. And the sort of shop steward for backbench MPs, Sir Graham Brady, chairman of the 1922 committee, went to see him. And Graham Brady said to the Prime Minister, sorry old chap, but the game is up, the party no longer supports mm. you, you're going to have to go. And the Prime Minister said to Sir Graham Brady, I mean, you may tell me that, but I don't believe you. And even if it's true, you can't force me out without an election. And I am going to fight to stay here. And then we got those extraordinary briefings out of that mm. place that, you know, he wasn't going to go. He was going to try and rebuild his government. We, but we were told there were going to be appointments of ministers last night. There were none. Uh, so it's po perfectly clear that he mm. was, you know, really struggling. Yeah. But still, he was in there claiming that he was going to remain prime minister. And then this morning, I mean, I've never seen anything like it. The person that he'd uh, appointed to be Chancellor just on Tuesday came out and said he's got to go in public on Twitter. And the woman who he'd appointed uh, Education Secretary, probably the drop of her dreams, resigned after having had the job for two days. At that moment, the game was absolutely comprehensively yeah. up. And he did do the yeah. logical thing, was to come out here and tell us he was resigning. But as you will have heard in my piece, yeah. he resigned not because he felt it was the right thing to do, yeah. but broadly because he felt he had no choice. OK, so much more to discuss and we will later on in the programme. But if Mr Johnson clings on to prime ministerial power, uh, prime ministerial power against his party's wishes, is there anything they can do to remove him? The 1922 Committee of Backbench Tories will meet on Monday to decide a timetable for the handover of party leadership. They could decide new rules to speed up the process. They could also urge the prime minister to make way for a caretaker leader, possibly Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab. Although the 1922 set the rules on replacing him as party leader and convention states the leader becomes prime minister, they have no formal power to force him out of number 10. The cabinet manual says that a PM will normally be the accepted leader of a political party that commands the majority of the House of Commons, but it does not say this must be the case. If that happened, Conservatives who wanted him out would have to back a Labour or a Lib Dem vote of no confidence in the entire government, which would oust the Prime Minister and give the Tories 14 days to unite around an alternative. It is just one of the issues worrying backbench Conservative MPs, even those who have wanted him out for months. A few months ago, this felt like a moment. In the name of God, go. But in truth, it was still a rare voice on the Tory benches. Even when 148 MPs voted against him... The parliamentary party does have confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Boris Johnson stayed put. But the scandal surrounding his deputy chief whip, Chris Pincher, and what appeared to be another lie. The Prime Minister did not immediately recall the conversation in late 2019. ..was just too much, and in came that avalanche of resignations. The reaction in Parliament, when the PM finally went, tended to go like this. I'm relieved that yesterday's madness has stopped um, and that we can have a period of stability, but I'm saddened and the, the atmosphere in Parliament has been very depressed. Am I relieved? Yes. Uh, by sort of midnight last night, I was, I was very angry because it was perfectly clear that he was going to have to resign. And, and frankly, if, if we hadn't had uh, the events of the last 24 hours or so, uh, I think that would have been better for his legacy. I think it would be better for him. And um, how do you think he's feeling right now? Uh, I imagine he's feeling sick because uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a tragedy uh, for him personally. I think he should resign as Prime Minister and as leader of the Conservative Party today. But the, and I know there are colleagues with other views and I respect those other views. But at the start of the day, many felt the same way, irritated to find out Mr Johnson would stay as PM. Boris needs to go now, not in the autumn, messaged one minister who'd resigned. Another agreed. There is a strong feeling the PM cannot be trusted to behave properly, they said. A third said no way about him staying. But as the day moved on, the mood shifted to this. It's ebbed and flowed, but consensus seems to be let him stay. 
There were reports that one reason the Prime Minister wants to stay is linked to his country home, Chequers, where he's planning a wedding party with his wife, Carrie, in late July. But for MPs who want to push him out, there is no mechanism to do that anyway. The rules in the Constitution are he remains Prime Minister until the Conservative Party has elected a new leader of the party. That is why conversations in Parliament's tea rooms have turned to speeding up this process. Sources tell me it is likely that the 1922 Committee of Conservative backbenchers who tend to meet upstairs will now push for candidates to face a vote of MPs within two weeks or less. The two finalists will then go in front of party members and I'm told that there is a proposal for that part of the process to be done so quickly that we have a new Prime Minister when MPs return here in September. What will be Boris Johnson's legacy? Well, the legacy will you know, ultimately be for historians to decide in time, but the immediate legacy, I think, will be one of unfulfilled promise. Huge potential, but ultimately, I'm afraid, unable to persuade people to have trust in what he was saying. Tonight, MPs headed into a well-timed party for The Spectator magazine. There were key backbenchers, former ministers, and even leadership hopefuls. But who is it who will be rebuilding that trust? And Anushka joins me now from outside Parliament. Anushka, Tory MPs, I guess, have had a little while to think about this now, because obviously the main events were this morning and lunchtime. What's the mood tonight? I mean, is it relief? Is it anger? How are MPs thinking about it? I mean, both of those things, Tom, but also a real sense of sadness. You know, earlier I was standing here talking to Theresa Villiers, the MP for Chipping Barnet. I said, you look shell-shocked. And she said, I am. It is a really big deal for us to remove a sitting Prime Minister, and particularly hard in a way for many of the newer Red Wall MPs who have seats in parts of the north of England and Midlands who feel that Boris Johnson really helped to win them their seats. You saw James Daly in that piece. He won Berry North with the smallest majority in the country. Earlier I was speaking to Sarah Brickliffe, who won Hindburn in Lancashire. She was only 24. She may not have thought she was going to actually win. The youngest Tory MP, Lee Anderson, who took Ashfield in the Midlands, texted me to say he was gutted. But they were all so angry about the revelations around Chris Pincher and furious last night when those briefings Robert talked about came out of Downing Street. So yes, some sadness, but a lot of relief, as you said, and they feel it is time now to move on. Anishka, thank you. We shouldn't, of course, uh, forget that it's only two and a half years since Mr Johnson won his party a very substantial majority. Now, there is something of a tradition in Conservative Party leadership contests that the early favourites never win. It's often less about having lots of supporters and more about not having too many enemies. Think Michael Heseltine versus John Major, for example. So far, only two of the smaller beasts of the party have committed to standing. Attorney General Suella Braverman declared on Robert Peston's show last Last night, and a Foreign Affairs Committee uh, Chairman Tom Tugendhat too. While another Brexit champion, Steve Baker, is thinking seriously about it. The big beasts, though, are already on manoeuvres, as the saying goes, plotting their paths to power. This is a race with many potential contenders. The front runners from within the current cabinet are probably Liz Truss, Nadim Zahawe, and out in front, Ben Wallace. His handling of the Ukraine crisis has made the Defence Secretary the clear favourite amongst party members. But this morning, he was tight-lipped on the subject of leadership. Let's see what the Prime Minister says. He's, he's still the Prime Minister. He's going to make a statement at 12.30, and after that statement, then I'll be happy to talk to people. Then there's Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid, who resigned so dramatically on Tuesday. Rishi Sunak's star has fallen from once giddy heights, but he is still a contender. Are you going to make a bid for the leadership, sir? The question is whether the Prime Minister's supporters forgive him for bringing their man down. I suspect that Nadim Zahawi, Liz Truss, other people who didn't resign, were thinking that they're going to try and woo those voters. It will hurt Rishi that he did quit. Whether or not he can overcome that with other supporters is, remains to be seen. Less well-known are Trade Minister Penny Mordaunt and the Attorney General Suella Braverman, who declared her candidacy last night before there was a vacancy. If there is a leadership contest, I will put my name 
into the ring. There's many, many priorities, but I think fundamentally we need to deliver some proper tax cuts so that people can be uh, dealing with the cost of living challenges in a more feasible way. We need to shrink the size of the state and cut government spending so we can curb inflation. And Mordaunt, a former defence secretary, is surprisingly popular for a junior minister. Penny Mordaunt is uh, leading, leading the polls. I think she'd be uh, terrific. I think that um, we'll see who else puts their hat in the ring. And from the back benches, Jeremy Hunt, Steve Baker and Tom Tuganat are all spoken of. Who do you think would be the best person to lead the party? I think Jeremy Hunt, if, if and when he declares, will be an absolutely fantastic candidate and a very, very strong one. And Steve Baker has organised some effective backbench campaigns. I have led sometimes up to a third of Tory MPs through the worst crises we've faced. I have to take seriously, therefore, suggestions to me that I should stand from my supporters. As the potential runners and riders head home tonight, they do not have long to make up their minds. Have you got a good team around you? Have you chosen a team? Oh, great evening. The exact rules for the contest aren't yet set, but broadly speaking, all the candidates will face a series of runoff votes amongst Tory MPs here in Parliament. At each stage, the one with the lowest number of votes is eliminated. Once they get down to the final two, they will then tour the country, trying to appeal to Tory party members. But before all that, the Backbench 1922 committee must decide how many backers each candidate needs to get onto the ballot. Carl Dinan, News at 10. Westminster. Well, Romilly is outside that Spectator magazine party, which we mentioned a moment ago. Lots of Conservative MPs are, of course, in attendance. Romilly, I'm assuming only one subject of conversation in there, or perhaps several, the last 24 hours being one, but a lot of people thinking about who's going to put their hat in the ring. What did you pick up? Oh, yes, Tom, it's always a feature in the diary of Tory MPs, this party. But tonight, the hot, packed garden behind the door here was particularly lively as key contenders took the opportunity to start greasing the wheels of their run for the leadership. And judging by those I've spoken to on the way out, it was Nadim Zahawi and Rishi Sunak who were getting a head start and creating a bit of a buzz about themselves. Rishi Sunak, former chancellor, is yet to declare, but I understand he's certain to do so and has already set up a campaign HQ. As for the new chancellor, Mr. Zahawi, uh, he hasn't declared yet either, but he uh, is already plotting with a, a campaign strategist. And then there are those outside the cabinet, like Tom Tuganat, who has said tonight that he is going to be running. He's promising to put together what he calls a broad coalition of support. So the, uh, the runners and riders are starting to line up. It is a very wide open open contest though with uh, at the moment looking like at least 11 potential contenders. 11. Good Lord, that is something. Now, Romilly, thank you very much. Well, one of the highly irregular aspects of the leadership contest when it gets going will be the absence of serious policy difference dividing the candidates, whoever they may turn out to be. If they do commit to honouring the party's 2019 manifesto, they will want to cut taxes. But that will be even harder now after a report uh, on the government's finances by its own watchdog. And Joel is at the Treasury to explain all. Joel, from where I was looking, that looked like a deeply sobering uh, briefing. Oh, goodness, it was, Tom. And remember, one of those manifesto pledges back in 2019 was to balance the books and make sure debt is falling uh, by the end of the Parliament. That's incredibly important that whoever gets installed by the next Prime Minister in the Treasury here has to honour those pledges, however much they want to cut taxes. Now, you may remember, Tom, back in March, the OBR assessed that the Chancellor then was on course to meet his fiscal rules with about £30 billion to spend. Spare. Some of that money, of course, could be used to fund tax cuts in theory. But today the OBR warned that that £30 billion has been disappearing steadily because the economic outlook is now much worse. It's at risk from high energy prices. It's at risk from rising interest rates. And it's also at risk from the fact that inflation is putting pressure on departmental budgets. It's putting pressure on pay, um, which would erode the nominal value of those budgets, which you have to remember was set back in October when we thought inflation was going to be closer to 4% rather than the double digits that the Bank of England is now forecast.
That vanishing £30 billion of headroom matters very greatly, Tom, because in the next few weeks we're likely to hear some of those candidates as they set out their stall for the uh, leadership election promise big tax cuts. The Owen OBR analysis suggests it would be very hard to cut taxes significantly without also cutting spending. Uh, it also takes the view that the public finances are on a completely unsustainable path in the long term. They're only sustainable in the short to medium term because of the tax rises that Rishi Sunak has introduced since the pandemic. Joel, it isn't what any of the candidates will want to hear, but thank you very much indeed. Now, in his speech here this lunchtime, the Prime Minister went out of his way to thank all those who had voted Conservative for the first time. Uh, in March last year, that included thousands of people in Hartlepool, where the Conservatives upended decades of Labour domination. So what did they make of today's events here in Downing Street? This is where the Conservatives sailed to one of their most historic victories. Last year's by-election win here in Hartlepool marked a high point in Boris Johnson's popularity. Since then, his support has ebbed away. He's limped on for all this time, completely selfishly. And I think we'll all be glad to see the back of him. I think we just need somebody to work together and help us get out of this rut that we're all in now. You want another general election? General election. Let the people have the vote. See what to say. It's a sociopath that won't go. That's my opinion. Man. Rewind to May 2021. Boris Johnson was here celebrating Hartlepool turning blue for the first time in nearly 50 years. It's a mandate for us to continue to, to deliver. The elbow pumps and inflatables are a world away from today's political reality. We're no further forward with the Tories. This business owner is utterly fed up with all the political parties. Has life improved for people in Hartlepool? No, it definitely hasn't. And you can take a look by the amount of food banks that we have in the town. People are still struggling. We're a dead-end little town that's not really got a lot going for us. So at the moment, we just really need some support. Others, like Philip, the taxi driver, completely disagree. Everything's been hard, but it's not Boris Johnson's fault. All fuel's gone up, everything's gone up but he's still doing his best to get us out of it. I think he's doing a very good job, and it's just a shame to see him go. He's being stabbed in the back. This is an area that has been hit hard by the rising cost of living. They've been promised so much under the levelling up agenda, and many of those here who voted Conservative for the very first time last year now feel let down. <laughs> Down the coast in Redka today, it felt like these Tories were in an alternative universe, trying to talk up new investment just as their leader resigned. But the strain was starting to show. I'm concentrating on delivering jobs and investment for Teesside, and there's a wonderful contrast there, isn't there? The debacle that's going on in Westminster now as a result of the Prime Minister's resignation, paired with the start of manufacturing, the start of construction. After another turbulent day, the question now turns to whether the Conservatives can shore up their support in places like this with a different leader at the helm. Sarah Corker, News at 10. Whatever else we may say tonight, there can be no doubting the wounds the Prime Minister will carry from this. Always a ragbag of contradictions, there was no doubting his personal popularity at its height, nor the dramatic nature of his ascent to power. Undeniably a bold risk-taker, he could be indecisive too. Just before the EU referendum, he actually wrote out in front of me on a paper tablecloth in a restaurant the competing arguments for and against Brexit. I left the restaurant convinced he would be for in, which perhaps reminds us on what small margins history can turn. So how did it go all so right and then so horribly wrong? He's a politician who's often appeared to defy gravity. Can you get me a rope? So how did Boris Johnson reach the end of the line? Go Boris! Go Boris! On first name terms with the voters, perhaps it was his familiarity oh, no. which made his stumbles his strength. It's a beautiful day, it's a beautiful river. And what could be more uh, lovely on a day like this than have a quick informal, uh, informal dip? As the first and only Conservative Mayor of London, there was almost nothing and no one he wouldn't tackle in the name of a good photo. The usual rules of engagement simply didn't apply. And I hereby declare that the said Boris Johnson is duly elected.
taking his personality to Parliament, it would be deployed on one of the biggest campaigns of our time. The pasty of independence. Charming voters to leave the EU with unconventional powers of persuasion. Admit that that figure no. is grotesquely misleading no. at best. I won't, I won't, I won't. Victory in the Brexit referendum would be his first of several, but not immediately. The Crown passed to Theresa May, but even beside her, Boris Johnson became a thorn in it. Eventually, he would replace her to begin a premiership often unprecedented. With gridlock over Brexit, Boris Johnson used his usual tactics to bulldoze it, triggering an election. Like never before, his character was called into question. Can you look at me in the eye and tell me that you, you haven't lied in your political career? I've absolutely not, absolutely not. And never, I've done, I've never done, I've, I've never tried to deceive the public. But again, his personality came with a premium. A landslide victory was his. This morning I, I went to Buckingham Palace and I am forming a new government. But charisma was not enough in a crisis. COVID-19 required a new seriousness. You must stay at home. But catching the virus himself, spending three days in intensive care, did not add caution to his character. Accused of making mistakes, this would be his most damaging. His fictional party was a business meeting. 